Sovereign Lord, we thank you for yet another opportunity that you've granted to us to gather together because of our common faith. Father, we pray that you grant us the grace to continue to desire to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray for this gathering. We pray that we will continue to consider how to stir up unto one another love and good deeds. Father, we pray for the many amidst us who are going through various challenges and trials in life. How we pray that you consider them and be gracious to them. Father, we pray that you hold them fast and you grant them the grace to still continue to trust in you despite the many challenges. Father, we pray for those of us who are also rejoicing for newborns and many other things. We pray that we will join them in praising and honoring you. And we pray that, Father, you will continue to hold us fast as one community, that we will continue to serve one another and love one another from a genuine and a pure heart. Would you grant us the grace? This morning, even as we look into your word, we pray that, Father, you will grant us the grace to be able to listen to your word and to understand your word. Father, give us your wisdom. We pray that you will hold us fast and that we will continue to desire to be rooted and grounded in your word and in your love. Father, I pray that as I bring your word to your people, would you speak to me? And speak through me. Pray that I will not lean on my own understanding. I will not depend on my research and study notes, but I will ultimately depend on your grace and your wisdom and your strength and your confidence. Pray all this in Christ's name. <clears throat> Amen. Good morning once again, Redeemer Bible Church. It's indeed a great um, privilege to be the one to bring God's word to us this morning. I don't take it for granted and pray that we will be able to fellowship together, considering the warmth of fellowship and gathering because of our common faith. And this morning, um, just to remind us, we have a members meeting in the afternoon and all of us are encouraged to join. It is open to everyone. So please purpose to be with us. By God's grace, we have been going through the book of Ephesians, and personally, I have greatly benefited from the series. And I pray that um, this morning, as we take a detour to the book of Jude, we will be able to also um, feed from it and just be able to see what truths that God wants us to know and the truths that God wants us to understand, and not only that, but the truths that God wants us to apply in our daily lives. <clears throat> For those of us who probably don't know or are not aware, Jude um, is, is a half-brother to Jesus and a brother to James. And we can be able to see in Matthew 23, it's, it records that he is a brother to Simon, Joseph, and James. And these are brothers to Jesus Christ. So in other words, he is a half-brother to Jesus Christ himself, who is his savior. And after resurrection, James and Jude became leaders of the church. And Jude wrote this letter. Very short, but with a heavy punch. And I pray that we will be able to just feed from God's word this morning. The book of Jude is considered to be notoriously um, hard or tough or difficult. And this is because of how it is composed. You know, the content um, has details about historic examples the content itself, even the structure of the book. And um, <clears throat> something interesting is that it addresses about the last times or the end times. And it's very important that we all are aware of why the book of Jude was written. Because it is entirely about the great apostasy or the false teachers who will appear in the last days. 
However, it's an important book that you and I as saints, you and I as Christians ought to know the book and to understand the book and understand why it was written for saints like you and me. And brothers and sisters, the book of Jude basically communicates the urgency of his notion, which is to call out false teachers and defend the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jude basically is calling us to call out false teachers and condemn them and remove them out of the church. And Jude basically saw that in the church, in the midst of the church, there were people and practices that deserved condemnation. And Jude is writing for us to be able to know, to be aware of these people who creep into the church, who bring in false teaching to divide the church apart. And these same people, they've been characterized by rejection of authority. They've been characterized by seeking to please themselves. They've been characterized by immorality, Man, all manner of ungodliness fills up their hearts, their minds, and their lives. <clears throat> and Jude, in response to that, he writes this letter. To you and me, that we have a responsibility to honestly contend for the faith. Because these people who creep in, they are very dangerous. And because they are dangerous, you and I ought to stand for the truth and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jude writes this letter and he shifts from his initial idea or his initial thought, which was to glorify the glorious gospel. But what Jude, Jude does is that he shifts from that thought and says, I am, and, and, and appears as if he is compelled to write to the saints to contend for the faith. And Jude helps us to understand why that is important. And that brings us to the whole purpose of the book of Jude, which is basically contending for the faith. You and I are called to defend the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jude is calling his audience to contend for the faith because he has realized that false teachers have crept into the church with false teachings and they want to cause division in the church. And Jude writes, and he wants to create awareness to his audience in order that they may fight for the gospel, in order that they may fight for the truth. And Jude writes for us to be able to understand that. And this morning, this is the call that I have to all of us and myself, that we will stand for the truth and we will stand to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jude admonishes us to contend for the faith because of the danger that comes with false teaching which is brought by false teachers into the church. And Jude wants us to understand that it is important to defend and protect the gospel. Jude wants us to understand why that is important. Here's the thing. You and I as saints are called to defend the gospel. Why? Because false teachers have crept into the church with false teachings and their plan is to divide the church. And Jude is calling his saints, his audience, stand up for the truth. Stand up for the faith that was once delivered to all the saints. Jude thought that it was helpful for believers to know and not only know, but to also fight for that same gospel. So brothers and sisters, as we look to this book, I pray that we will be reminded of this, that since Christ has accomplished salvation, believers are called to hold fast to him and contend for the faith. Let us turn to the book of Jude and read together. <clears throat> I will be reading from the English Standard Version. Jude, I'll be reading the first 16 verses that we will be looking at today. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brothers, brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, 
although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued a natural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal life. <clears throat> yet in a manner, yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, he was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in a way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain of, to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves waterless clouds swept along by winds. Fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead uprooted, wild wolves of the sea casting up the form of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about this that Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness and to, uh, that they have committed in such an ungodly way. And all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him, these are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism and to gain advantage. And that's the word of God. Brothers and sisters, I pray that we will be able to see at least three things that I have for us. One, be aware of who you are. That is in the first two verses. Second point, be aware and reject the presence of false teachers. And thirdly, be aware of the impending judgment. So you and I are saints, be aware of who we are. Be aware and reject the presence of false teachers. Be aware of the impending judgment. First point, be aware of who you are. Consider how Jude begins his letter. Jude is very, in, uh, does a very interesting job when he begins his letter. He wants us to understand that there is something that you and I ought to know about his identity and our identity. But the first two verses, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, love be multiplied to you. Jude identifies himself as a half-brother to James, but not to Jesus. That's very interesting because we know that Jude is a half-brother to Jesus Christ, but he introduces himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. And this reveals something about Jude that he wants us to know. It reveals something about him. Instead of boasting of the fact that he is a half-brother to Jesus Christ, instead of boasting that he has the same lineage, same background uh, with Jesus Christ, Jude begins by saying, 
servant of Jesus Christ. In other words, he wants us to understand that his identity is found in Jesus Christ, who is his Lord and Savior and Master, hence his service to Jesus Christ, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. He wants us to understand that his identity ultimately is not found in the fact that he is the half-brother to Jesus, but he is found in the fact that Jesus Christ is his Lord and Savior and Master. And Jude wants us to understand that as he begins, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, brother of James. And Jude understands that Jesus Christ is his master and savior. And in, in his description, he wants us to know and understand that he is not the central point of this letter, but Jesus Christ is the central idea and the central point of this letter. And he says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. Basically, in other words, what he is doing, he is stepping out of the way for the sake of Christ Jesus to be known, for the sake of Christ Jesus to be proclaimed, for the sake of Christ Jesus to be known and seen both as Lord, Savior, and Master. And that is what Jude is, is doing here. He wants us to understand that his identity is found in Jesus Christ. And you and I, this morning, we also need to remember who we are. That our identity, our worth, our purpose is ultimately found in nothing else and no one else other than in Christ Jesus, who is our Lord, our Savior, and our Master. <clears throat> and not only that, but Jude also is concerned about Christ receiving glory and not himself. Because he is just but a servant who has a master, Jesus Christ. And his concern is that Jesus Christ will be glorified. Other than that, something else that Jude is doing here. Jude wants us to understand that he is also concerned about the church of God, or rather the body of Christ. Jude wants us to understand in his description that like Paul and James and Peter, who are considered to maybe high-profile guys in the church, Jude is not probably consider that because many times we rarely quote Jude, but we can quote Paul, Peter, James, and many other people. But Jude understands that he is serving a high-profile God. And he is concerned about the church of God. And this is what he does. He said, to those who are called Beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Jude is concerned about the body of Christ. And it is clear that his concern about the, the body of Christ is basically more important than his background and his lineage of being a half-brother to Jesus Christ. And there's something that Jude wants us to impress. There are truths that Jude wants us to impress in our hearts. And these are concerning our spiritual well-being as Christians, both individually but more so at a corporate level, as a church, a community, gathering of the saints. And Jude wants us to understand that we as saints who are called, beloved in God the Father, kept for Jesus Christ, later on, we need to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to all the saints. And Jude is concerned about the church. He said, call, he uses the words called, beloved in God the Father, kept for Jesus Christ. Called. Jude basically understands that the saints are called by God and saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, and in Christ alone. So they were called by God. And not only that, but they were also beloved in God the Father. And this same God also kept them for Jesus Christ. And Jude already understands that he is a servant of Jesus Christ. Basically, he is reminding his audience of their identity, that they are called and saved by God. We've seen his identity is found in Jesus Christ. He's now pointing us to his audience that their identity is also found in Jesus Christ. And this morning, you and I need to also think about this. Where do we find our identity? If not in Christ, 
where else? And so Jude wants us to understand that their identity, the, 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 the identity of their audience, the hope of their audience, the, the assurance that they will be kept in God and kept for Jesus Christ is ultimately found in Jesus Christ. And basically he reminds them that they are called by God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, by his grace, through faith alone, which is in Christ alone. And that's a clear indication of God's love to his people, God's love that was displayed by the death of his one and only son, Jesus Christ. That is a great assurance that you and I have. And I pray that we will be able to see how God in his own mysterious ways, according to his sovereign will, called us to be his, and we are not our own. To those who are called beloved in God the Father, Jude also addresses his listeners as beloved in God the Father. He basically reminds them of a love that really matters. This is God's unfailing and never-ending love to his people that he has called, to his people that he has saved, to his people that he loves. This is God's love, God's unfailing and never-ending love to his people. And he wants us to understand that is also important to his audience. That when they think about this kind of love that has been bestowed upon them, they ought to remember who they are. That they are called and they are beloved in God the Father. Friends, we are called and saved by God's grace alone. And we are given a new identity to become children of God. But more so, we are held together in a relationship that transcends all of them. And that is being beloved in God. And we are called according to his purpose because God's love protects us from the outside and strengthens us within ourselves. Romans 8 reminds us that for those who love the Lord, all things work together for them that are called according to his purpose. And that's a beautiful thing that you and I can rest on the fact that we are beloved in Christ. To those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Jude also, in addition to being called, in addition to being beloved in God, also want us to understand that these saints are also kept for Jesus Christ. And what he is trying to say here is basically reminding us that saints can take comfort in the fact that they are kept by God himself for Jesus Christ. In other words, we are preserved for Jesus Christ. Romans 8 um, reminds us that nothing can separate us from the love of God, and we are assured of that. And Jude wants us to just remember that this means that Christians are secure for the future when Jesus comes back again to take his bride, the church, to his home. Jude reminds us that it is very clear that you and I ought to remember who we are. We ought to be aware of who we are. It's very clear that you and I ought to be aware of who we are because we are called and we are beloved in God the Father and we are kept in Jesus for Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, be aware of who you are. Because this display of God's goodness has every reason for Jude to pray this way. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you who are called, to you who are beloved in God, to you who are kept for Jesus Christ. That's so encouraging, isn't it? It is very encouraging that we are called, we are beloved in God the Father, and we are also kept for Jesus Christ. We ought to praise God for such a great love that has been displayed on us. Second point, Jude also, um, I also ho hope to help us just see how um, it's important to be aware and reject 
the presence of false teachers. In verse 3 and 4, Jude tells us, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in and noticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, and godly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus. Jude launches into his main body, into the main body of his short letter. And he begins with something that al almost seems like an apology, but it's not really an apology. He wants us to see something about that. It appears that his initial thought, his initial desire, his initial plan was to share about our glorious gospel. As he puts it, our common faith. But this faith is also the faith that bounds him with his audience, his audience to him, and them all together with God. He wanted to talk about that, but instead, he shifts from that thought and that desire and that idea to exhort them to contend for that faith. And Jude is compelled to address the issue of false teachers here. He is telling them, Although I was eager to write to you about our common faith, I found it necessary, appealing to you to contend for the faith. Why? For certain people have crept in unnoticed who are designated for this condemnation. Friends, the church is called to uphold and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice that the very thing that upholds and defends the church is the very thing that the church is called to uphold and defend. And that's the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jude is pleading with his saints to contend for the faith. He is pleading with them to stand up for truth, to fight for the gospel. Jude is beseeching them, pleading with them to stand and contend for the faith, this faith that was once shared, once and for all, to all saints. Friends, we ought to defend the gospel because the survival of the church depends on the strength and the defensing, defensive powers of the gospel. And you and I, as saints, we have a responsibility to defend the gospel. It is also important to understand that the faith that Jude is talking about here is referring to the body of truth that comprises of the gospel. Basically, the great truth about divine word and divine deed. And that is where the gospel rests on. And Jude wants us to understand that it is important of, to know the faith that he is talking about. Because if we know it, we will fight for it. In the New Testament, scripture reminds us, um, Romans 6, 17, the body of truth is referred to as the standard of teaching to which you and I were committed. 2 Timothy 1.3, Scripture reminds us that the body of truth is the pattern of sound words you have heard from me. 2 Timothy 1.14 reminds us that the body of truth is the good deposit entrusted to our care. This standard of teaching, this pattern of sound word, this good deposit, this body of truth has been entrusted to us to believe and practice, and practice involves defending it at all costs. Friends, scripture reminds us, we need to know that the church is called to embrace the gospel, to know the gospel, to live in light of the gospel, and to defend the same gospel at all costs. As some author puts it, the church is the gospel made visible. I pray that we will see how we are called to contend for the faith and why we are called to contend for the faith that has been entrusted to us, that has been bestowed on us by God himself through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the call to contend for the faith is not an easy call. In and of its own, it's costly. And at least, at least in the English dictionary, Contend means to struggle with so much difficulty. In the Greek translation, it implies the idea of pain. From that, it's, it's very 
clear that it already indicates that for some, this battle will not be easy. For some, this battle will be costly. Martyrs have, been, have shed blood for the sake of de defending the gospel. Some saints have been jailed for the sake of defending the gospel. Some saints have been tortured for the sake of defending the gospel. Some saints have been rejected by their families for the sake of defending the gospel. And some saints, up to date, they still contend for that faith. Oh, church, arise and know who you are. Oh, church, arise and defend that which has been bestowed upon you. Oh, church, arise and defend the gospel. Arise, be acquainted with the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and defend it. Because uh, that gospel is very important for you and me. And Paul says, if we are not careful, these men who crept in, their goal is to divide the church. Stand up for what you have and fight for the faith, for the faith that was once for all delivered to all saints. You and I, too often, we have failed in this call. You and I have failed in appreciating the gospel and the wonderful salvation that it provides. You and I have failed in that. And that clearly shows how sinful nature still resides in us. That reminds us of sin. And it reminds us of our sinful nature that you and I rejected him when he came to his own. You and I have taken God's love for granted. You and I have sinned against our holy God. You and I have despised his authority. You and I have disregarded his perfect will. You and I have rejected his sovereign will. You and I have disrespected him. We have sinned against our holy God. You and I are sinners. And what you and I deserve is God's holy wrath. But God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while you and I are still sinners, Christ died for us. For God did not send his own son into the world to condemn the world, but God sent him in order that the world might be saved through him. Friends, I pray that we will see that beauty of the gospel, because this is the gospel the gospel is the power of God to save sinners who cannot save themselves. Pray that we will see that. And after seeing that, we will embrace it. And after embracing it, we will guard it and defend it with everything that we ought to. It's only when we grasp the greatness of the gospel that we can know and realize the importance of contending for the faith. But we cannot defend what we don't even know. We cannot defend what we don't even understand. We have to know the gospel, understand the gospel, love the gospel, appreciate the gospel in order to defend the gospel. Friends, since Christ has accomplished salvation, believers are called to fight for the truth and hold fast to him who is able to keep us from stumbling. And Jude is talking about this because he realizes that there are some men who have crept inside the church. And these men are ungodly. They are immoral. They come filled up with so much immorality. And their goal is to divide the church. And Jude says, be watchful in other words. Because certain men have crept in unnoticed. And these people, they are immoral. They are filled up with all manner of ungodliness. They claim to be more biblical than anybody else. They have a very good touch of PR. They claim to be very biblical than any other person. These people, they are dangerous to the life of the church. They will not triumph. Though. At least we have that assurance. But these people, they are marked for condemnation. They have a destiny. Judy is saying that they were 
long ago designated for this condemnation. They have a destiny, and their destiny is eternal damnation, eternal death, eternal separation from God. That is their destiny. And you and I need to be very careful when these people creep in and defend for the faith. Friends, these men are ungodly. They disregard God. They turn God's grace into sensuality. They turn God's grace and take advantage of it to involve and indulge themselves in immorality and ungodliness. These men are very dangerous in the life of the church. They refuse to recognize who Jesus was. They deny God in their life, in their thoughts, in everything that they do. They are dangerous and we must be aware because it's important to be aware in order to fight for the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that has been bestowed upon you and me. So friends, church, arise and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you realize the call that you and I are called to do? Do you realize the weight that comes with it? Do you realize how important it is for you and I to defend the gospel? Oh, church, arise and look to God for wisdom and grace in order to defend the gospel. Oh, church, arise, be acquainted with the gospel. Know yourself, know your God, and know these people. Because their characteristics are clearly displayed in the scriptures, and we will know them by their fruits. Oh, church, arise and defend the gospel. Oh, church, arise and be the belt of truth. O oh, church, arise and take up the sword of the Spirit. Church, arise and put on the full armor of God and contend for the faith. I pray that we will consider this call for the assurance that Christ accomplished salvation and you and I as saints can hold fast to him and defend the truth of Jesus Christ. The third point, be aware of the impending judgment. <clears throat> Jude helps us to see basically the fate of the wicked disturbers from verse 5 through um, 16. He helps us to understand that God punishes the wicked. He helps us to understand that God will destroy this man and evil will not triumph over the church. And the summary here is basically judgment for intruders. Because they crept into the church unnoticed. Basically, they are intruding. So there is a judgment for them. And God is the righteous judge. Jude 5 to 10 reminds us that read, reminds the readers that judgment will come upon all those who are ungodly and immoral. And on all those who turn away and reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. Judgment will be upon them. Consider verse 5 to verse 7. Um, Jude mentions th at least three historical examples of God's judgment. He says, Jesus saved Israel from Egypt and destroyed those who did not believe in Jude 5. Even though Israel was delivered from Egypt, the generation that did not believe was destroyed. And they never made it to the land of promise. In verse 6, Jude mentioned about um, the angels. God bound the angels who sinned in Genesis chapter 6. And these angels, they sinned to God by having sexual relations with women. And since they did not adhere to the boundaries of, to the boundaries between men and angels, which was established by God, then judgment is their portion. And God has now restrained them and limited them, uh, and they will face judgment from God himself. Angels, they fell, they sinned against God, they became fallen angels, and they are demons who now um, <clears throat> are limited and restrained, awaiting God's judgment. And Jude also mentions um, about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, basically the point here is that God destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? In the nearby towns, because they indulged themselves in sexual sin in a shameless way in Jude 7. And God will, and God punished that. God judged them and punished them for their sin against God. And brothers and sisters, the destruction of these cities 
serves as a, as, as a type and anticipation of the judgment that is to come. The destruction here serves as the judgment that is yet to come to all those who are false teachers with their false teachings, with their followers, and all those who are ungodly and immoral in every manner of way. Jude um, 8 to 10 mentions um, how we can apply these historical judgments to ourselves. And he does that to his readers. And he wants, to, and, and, and to, uh, he wants the readers or his audience to basically understand that false teachers come and they justify their behavior with dreams and so-called revelations. And they deserve judgment because they come in unnoticed with good PR and they want to divide the church but they appear as those who are biblically mature they appear to be those who are sound and sober yet they are not they are very dangerous and judgment will befall upon them what they do is that they refuse to submit to any authority but condemn the angelic powers and that is what they do. Brothers and sisters, as a way of contrast, Jude mentions Archangel Michael on this other end. And he says, um, <coughs> in, Jude, in Jude 10, he says, but these people blaspheme all that they do, do not understand, and they're restrained. In, in, from Jude 10, all that, um, and they are destroyed by all they, like unreasoning animals. Sorry, in verse, verse 9, not 10. But when the archangel, Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. The archangel, Michael, understands that judgment belongs to God. And what he does, he steps out of the way, and he says, the Lord rebuke you. And in the same way, God will rebuke all who are ungodly. God will judge all who are immoral. God will judge the apostates, the false teachers, with their teachings, with their followers. God will judge them. And the Lord will rebuke them of their sin. And the archangel understood that God is the just and the righteous judge. And you and I ought to remember that. The judgment will come upon false teachers and they will not flee from it. So brothers and sisters, Let's be careful not to be lured away by the teachings of false teachers. Consider verse 11 to 13. Jude helps us understand how, like, just like the Old Testament prophets pronounce misery, Jude helps us to understand that he is also pronouncing it to all those who are going astray. So brothers and sisters, be aware of the impending judgment in verse 11, he mentioned, um, verse 11 through 13, he mentions three historical characters. He mentions Cain, Balaam, and Korah. And in Genesis 4, if you know the story of Cain, Cain is jealous of the brother, Abel. And what he does, what is happening is that he is filled up with sin and puffed up with so much sin to the point that his reaction is killing his own brother. Judgment will come upon him. If you look at Numbers 22 and 24, the story about Balaam, Balaam is given a message by an angel to deliver, but instead he rebels, he, he, he disobeys that. And what he does is that he is filled up with so much sin and desires the love of money, desires to just earn money. With, uh, the, uh, and, and if you look at the whole story, he is basically rebellious. He is basically disobedient. The other person is Korah. Korah, in Numbers 16, we see the rebelliousness of Korah against Moses. And that idea of rebelliousness, that idea of the love of money, that idea of ungodliness, that idea of Cain being jealous, all of this puffed up sin in them, they will be with such traits when they come the false teachers. They will be filled up with rebelliousness, greed, sinful life, jealous life. But judgment will be upon them. Friends, 
Jude helps us to see that they are like empty clouds without rain when they come. They are like dead trees with no fruit. It's like a borehole without water. Jude wants us to understand that they, have, they, they are empty when they come. They are very empty. They don't have anything to give, anything to offer. But we have something to offer, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we can offer the gospel and preach the gospel faithfully and live in light of the gospel faithfully and defend the gospel. We can offer them the gospel. In verse 13, it, it just reminds us of how their shameful way of living is comparable to the wild surging waves of the sea. Basically, they are wandering away from the truth. They don't want the truth. And that is why when they come in, we need to defend the truth because they don't want the truth. They don't love the truth. They don't know the truth. How I pray that if they know the truth, they will be set free. Just as you and I, when we knew the truth, we were set free by the truth of Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. In verse 14 to 16, Jude mentions about um, the prophecy of Enoch. And a prophecy of Enoch is cited here. Probably Jude um, <coughs> quotes the book, not because it is scripture, but because it is important for his readers. We can assume that it was important for his readers, and that is why he is mentioning it here. Jude is quoting this book, and when he does that, he doesn't mean that it is inspired in scripture. Though it does reflect something that is true, it doesn't mean it is inspired. And we might think that the prophecy of First Enoch contains something surprising. Actually, what it actually contains is the same thing that Jude says here, that when the Lord comes, he will judge all those who lived and spoke in an ungodly way. Jude certainly understands here, as he mentions it, that this day, he knows that the Lord here refers to the coming of Jesus Christ in his future coming, which will involve judgment of all manner of ungodliness, malice, immorality. And Jesus Christ will one day come and he will pronounce judgment upon all evil. Friends, this gives us the assurance that you and I ought to defend the gospel because we know one day Christ will come. You and I ought to defend the gospel because we know the truth and the beauty of the gospel that has been bestowed upon us as saints. You and I ought to defend this gospel at all times. I pray that we will be able to see that. If you look at these um, three incidences here, they all end in death and destruction. The three historical examples, the three historical characters, the prophecy Enoch is making, it all ends in death and destruction. And God knew that they were coming and they will not triumph in the church. Brothers and sisters, it's important to understand that these people who live ungodly lives, who exchange the teaching of God's grace into sensuality, and took advantage of that to live in sinful way, in all manner of sins, judgment will come upon them. And that should make us know that this is such a holy God, and we ought to praise him in reverence and in awe. The stories in the Old Testament, the prophets, it reminds us that only the, only the saints can do the work of God that God's work can only be done by those who are spiritually qualified. In other words, those who are called, those who are saved, those who are beloved in God the Father and walking with God diligently. It reminds us that you and I ought to be responsible in how we live our life as saints and as a church. And because of this assurance that false teachers will not triumph, you and I have confidence in God that he will keep us and he will preserve us for Jesus Christ. You and I have this assurance that since Christ has accomplished salvation, believers are to hold fast to Christ and defend 
the gospel. To those of us in our midst who probably Christ is not your savior and your master, I want you to think, to take a moment and just think about your life. Consider how the world is so hopeless. Consider how the world is so restless. Consider how the world has nothing to offer. And ask yourself, where is your hope? This world is filled with so much sin, all manner of pain, suffering, sin, all manner of ungodliness, all manner of immorality. The world is filled with so much of that. There's no peace, no rest, no comfort, no love at all. And I pray that you will know that God is more than willing to save you if you turn away from your sin and turn to him and believe in him, he is able to save you from your sin and from his wrath. I pray that the groan of your heart will be, oh, have mercy on me, oh, save me a sinner. To those of us who are seated here, basically Redeemer Bible Church, and all attending saints, we live in a very unique time in history. And there's a lot of false teachers, a lot of false teachings in our midst. And you and I ought to know the book of Jude and the whole Bible at large in order for us to defend the gospel that we share. You and I, as Christians, and the church today, ought to be very careful and guard the gospel. Friends, I pray that you and I we will not only just want to learn the gospel and understand it, but we will also apply it by defending it at all costs. And the, qu the big question for us is how well acquainted with the gospel are you in order to contend for the faith? Because if you want to contend for the faith, you have to know what that faith is. These people, they come with unbiblical thoughts, views, perspectives, and worldly perspectives. And we have to know the gospel in order to contend for the gospel. We don't need strategies that come from the world. We don't need 10 ways to become the better us. We just need the gospel. You and I need the, to know the gospel and understand the gospel. And since now we are aware of who we are, called, beloved, and kept for Jesus Christ. Now, since we are aware of the presence of the false teachers and their teachings, since we are aware of the impending judgment, I beg of us, I plead with us, please immerse yourself in the gospel. Saturate yourself with the gospel in order to defend this gospel. How well acquainted with the gospel are you in order to defend the gospel? O oh, church, arise. Since Christ has accomplished salvation, hold fast to him and defend the faith. O oh, church, arise, because this is the confidence that the Spirit of God will use the word of God to do the work of God and build the church of God for the glory of God. The Spirit of God will use the word of God to do the work of God and build the church of God for the glory of Christ our Savior. I pray that we will look to God and trust in him who is able to keep us from stumbling. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your word that is true and living. Thank you for your word that is sharper than a double-edged sword. Thank you for your word that is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Oh, Father, how we pray that your spirit will use your word to do your work and build your church for your glory. Pray this in Christ's name.